Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Frederick Hayward from the German Embassy in Ottawa. As many of you know, January 27th is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And as we had great success with tours in the fall with Alexander Green, we wanted to invite you again today to partake in the state of remembrance. January 20th last week marked the 80th anniversary of the Wannsee Conference, which formalized the systematic persecution and murder of Jews throughout Europe. We must assume our responsibility to preserve and protect the historical facts of the Holocaust, both for the victims, but also for our shared future. In light of this, we wanted to offer you a tour through the um, memorials and monuments in Berlin for the victims of National Socialism. We also invite you to learn more about a recent initiative adopted by consensus at the UN brought forward by Israel and Germany on Holocaust denial and distortion. So we will be starting our tour today in Berlin Mitte and follow our city expert Alexander Green throughout the next 90 minutes. Throughout the tour, I want to encourage you to ask any questions or make any comments, but we do ask that you remain muted if you are not speaking. So without further ado, I now pass you over to the very capable Alexander Green. So everybody can hear me, I hope now. Um, it might also do to bandwidth during the tour a good idea that you turn off the video unless you say something. I mean, uh, because it says we have more than 40, almost 50 people now. Uh, we might have some issues. We might not. I'm just uh, good. I, as you can see, am sitting, seated at the uh, memorial of the murdered European Jews, where we are going to start our tour. I wanted to tell a little bit about myself. I don't know from the amount of people who has been on the tours in November, December, uh, when we had uh, a tour focusing more on Jewish history and present. Um, today, we'll also deal with present because we deal with memory and uh, as yesterday, I heard the 100-year-old Holocaust survivor, Margot Friedlander, saying that we are now the witnesses of our time, meaning that we are also, because we had the chance to hear people that lived through that, we are actually taking on their memory upon us and also upon the generations to come. And uh, so this actually has been part of my work since I have returned to Berlin in um, 2001 from Israel. I was born in 1971 in Germany, in, East, in West Germany, sorry, in Hamburg. Uh, grew up in actually a mixed Jewish Christian family. We always kind of celebrated both holidays, but uh, it was very clear that a big part of the identity or the part also that I choose uh, was uh, being part of uh, a Jewish community. I'm talking in a very broad sense here. And that also came from a very long uh, experience that I had as a kid um, being dragged to all kinds of ceremonies, especially on the 9th of November, of course, which happens to be my birthday. <laughs> so it was always a weird combination for me of life and also the commemoration of death. And I think this is something that is directly related to the memorial of the murdered European Jews that you can see behind me. And I want to take you, without saying much now, a little bit through this memorial, which was opened in 2005, after a long discussion. Yeah, one can say it took 35 years for this memorial to be built, because already in the 1970s, there were ideas of having a central memorial in the former, well, from West Germany, it was the former capital, 
Yeah, back then uh, in East Germany, of this was the capital, but of the capital of the Nazis. It is very windy. I hope you don't have too much disturbances. I'm trying to cover my ears a little bit because of the airports. Is it okay? It sounds good. Great. Um, we have here a memorial. Uh, which is called the Memorial of Murdered European Jews. It's not called Holocaust Memorial, though many people actually shorten it to it, but they also change with this shortening the meaning of it. Because this is actually not related to the Holocaust itself, but it is related to the stories of people who happen to be, and we remember this on this day, who happen to be Holocaust victims, but who also happen to be way, way more than that. And uh, I will later also show kind of an exemplary story, some stories, and, um, but let's first do as I said, let's walk a little bit uh, together through this memorial. Um, I will not talk for a while, because I, I always feel that actually inside this field of steel eyes of blocks, yeah, um, it is a place of silence. So let's start with that. From here, then later, we'll go and see a couple of other memorials that I will uh, tell you on the way, but we'll kind of come back also uh, to the Holocaust Remembrance uh, Day dedicated also to the liberation, obviously, of Auschwitz um, 77 years ago and to the fate of many, many Jews that were murdered and in other places. As you can see, while walking through this memorial, one idea of the <coughs> excuse me, architect Peter Eisenman, who built this in 2005, planning it together with Richard Serra, the uh, American artist who dropped out of the project later. But uh, one idea of Peter Eisenman was not to build a memorial where you stand in front and where you see something that stays in a distance from you. One idea is that with this memorial, you walk through, you get intrigued walking in, you do see 
people passing by, appearing, disappearing, and also you slowly disappear in this memorial. The city around you disappears. And then uh, as, well, I'm getting out of this 2,711 blocks, to one of the sides, you do see we also slowly reappear in city life. And this memorial here yeah, uh, was built in a very, very central spot. Some of you obviously have been to Berlin. And this central spot is between the Brandenburg Gate, a place where many people go to and we will also pass by later, to the Potsdam Square, which is a main entertainment area. And one idea of leaving it open and usually no fence around it. At the moment, there is kind of a temporary fence because there had been corona and anti-corona demonstrations here yesterday, but uh, it's open, it's open to the public. It's kind of inviting. And as I was seated on one of these blocks before, uh, many people sometimes come here, they relax. And even if they don't exactly know what it is, they do realize something about this place because this place has a certain solemnity and a vastness. And I wanted to share with you now a picture from the memorial seen from above. Sorry, I always turn sidewards when I'm sharing these pictures, but... Okay. Yeah. So this is on a way nicer day. You see the Bundestag, also known as Reichstag or former Reichstag in the back here. And you do see this wavy structures of blocks. Peter Eisenman never really explained exactly what this memorial is. Peter Eisenman said it's an open field it's dedicated to the victims, but he also rejected the idea of a cemetery, though obviously, obviously, um, somebody taking a picture of me. Um, obviously, the idea of a cemetery is here, especially when you have a look at this blocks. Yeah, uh, a bit like uh, markers. Personally, it reminded when I saw this the first time, it reminded me of the Mount of Olives with all these like uh, rectangular, same shaped tombs. But um, Peter Eisenman said these blocks are basically also showing the idea here of a destruction, a destruction of communities. And on this picture that I showed before, I think maybe it is even clear that it looks a bit like as if a block of the city has been erased. Um, the spot here was part of the tear garden. It was not, nothing was built here. Nothing related to the Holocaust happened on this spot. Uh, we are though very close to Hitler's bunker, we are very close to the chancellery, we are very close to all kinds of institutions involved in organizing the Holocaust, the Shoah. Very often I, being an educator, I use words that are way clear. I talk of mass murder, and but also talk about the particularity. But um, it is not part of a crime scene. And this is very important. Though so obviously Berlin is a crime scene, but, this spot here, yeah, uh, being a park, is actually like a cemetery, which also wanted to disconnect the victims from the crimes. Because as I said before, they were more 
than victims. And if we lost a relative or a friend in, let's say, car accident, we will probably remember the accident at the spot where it happened. And we might remember that person in that accident, but we'll definitely not bury that person there. We won't feel, uh, we won't feel that it will be appropriate. Because I think it's also necessary here, this uh, disconnection, um, especially in a place like Berlin, because obviously we have many, many sites here that are directly related to the crimes. Um, maybe a short moment here for questions or remarks. Maybe there was something in the chat. I, uh, it's a bit difficult for me to open the chat. So um, if there is something, if Frederick or Micah could read it out, it would be great. Or just feel free to unmute yourself and say something. I found walking through it uh, as a non-Jew, um, it, it started to feel like you were just seeing one thing and not being, losing your awareness of everything, of the context. You're just seeing one thing, you need to get through it and get out and mm -hmm. not, not really almost able to, to get any sense of, context and information so it I always wondered how did this happen and how did people not know what was going on and it was sort of feeling like that was happening more as I went through it like at first you could see and then it's just I'm just seeing what whatever this structure wants me to see yeah well two things um yes there is no information on this blocks Yes, there is barely a sign pointing out what it is, which very often creates a situation that people started to want, starting to wonder. Uh, I, it happened to me a couple of times here as I lead tours in the city. I work for various institutions here that people ask me like, is this what I think it is? Because they kind of heard about it. They saw it and it has this, emptiness, this vastness, this question also. And I think really the idea of not pointing out what it is makes actually people come here. But there is also below this memorial, a place of information. So it's not just a memorial. It's also, I wouldn't call it museum because it's way too small and it does not claim to show everything about the Holocaust. But uh, I'll show you on this question comes at the perfect timing because I also wanted to show you uh, some things uh, of the underground of the exhibition in the underground. Sorry. Um, I found it different. powerful as an experience to maybe this is what was some mm -hmm. people felt like not not knowing, mm -hmm. but knowing and yeah yeah so okay sorry this is the second picture um so below this blocks and i hope you're able to see the picture i sometimes takes a bit until it comes up but below this blocks you have on the ground um exhibits in this case what you see here are letters, last letters very often, written by people just before they were either deported or even some letters were written literally on the spots, for example, of mass shootings. Farewell letters very often. And then out of a sudden, these blocks, these unpersonal blocks, they are connected below ground to the memory, to the life of the people. Uh, I'm saying the life of the people because I want to read you one letter from a Jewish girl. She was 12 years old. Yeah. Her name was Judith Vishnetskaya. 
And there was a letter found on a spot outside uh, Babiar where she was shot. A letter from her mother where was to her father who had escaped. And the daughter writes a couple of words. And she writes the following. Dear father, I am saying goodbye to you before I die. We would so love to live, but they won't let us. I am so scared of this death because I see small children being thrown alive into this pit. Goodbye forever. I kiss you tenderly, your Judith. This is one of the letters and they are on exhibit down there, there are about 32, but there are obviously hundreds of these letters. These are still the exception. Many times we simply don't know at all what were the last thoughts, yes? What, how it happened, what had happened for them, I mean, as a personal experience. And this is really one idea also of this uh, memorial in the underground of this place of information is not giving you more information about the organization and how many, obviously this is also there. Uh, there is a room down below. Uh, I'm showing this picture, for example, where there are family stories. So it goes from the individual to the family. Yeah, and I'll give you one story here of a, ah, sorry, I, this is not a very good picture, but this is the Kyrillic translation uh, transcript of this letter I've just, I just read. The original letter was lost. Sorry, I have to share, get out and share something else again. I thought I put all of them in. One other story I wanted to tell here is the story of Sara de Majo and her family that you can see here. You see 43 people on this picture, many children as well. Out of this 43 people, from a family from Belgrade. They were a Sephardic Jewish family, Oriental Jewish family. Sarah is seen on the very, very left. Yeah, not the woman that is cut, but the woman that is on the very left side. I hope it's left on your screen too. Uh, uh, and you see her family from this 43 people, only six survived. Sarah, uh, here you can see her with her uh, five daughters and uh, her boy with his uh, wife on the photograph here. The wife uh, with a man standing next to Sarah, they survived because he was not Jewish and that granted some kind of protection to her. Uh, Sarah de Majo, and this is a year before, in 1943, she was deported. This is already after many of the family that we saw in the picture before were killed in mass shootings outside uh, Skopje, where they have escaped to in Belgrade. This is another picture from her younger times. I, uh, these are working women. She worked in some weaving factory for some time and what i absolutely love about this picture is that they all have all drink coffee and they all these women smoke uh, on this picture quite ostensibly uh, and sarah here is the a map that you can also see below so yeah she was from belgrade escaped to uh, Skopje, uh, which, was, which was Macedonia, so actually another country. Uh, uh, but then it, it, things got difficult there. She got back to Belgrade. 
escaped to Zagreb and uh, from Zagreb to, uh, she was already deported first to Vienna, but that was more a uh, station on the way, on a long way actually to Treblinka, where we don't know the exact date, but where uh, in uh, 1943, before the end of the year 1943, uh, she was murdered. We don't know if she died of starvation or other things, or if she was among, among those people that were gassed. This memorial today, very, very empty, partly because of the grim weather, partly also because we have uh, restrictions and very few tourists yes, in town. But uh, there are very often many, many school groups here walking around, walking through. And yes, sometimes also screaming, playing hide and seek here. Which, especially after the stories I told, seem to seems like disrespectful or seems something that well shouldn't should should you do this in on a memorial? Um, Peter Eisenman, the architect, once said that uh, actually he wants people here to to do what they feel they want to do. Obviously not. Uh, destroying or desecrating the place. But he said, if people are disturbed by how other people behave, they should talk to each other. They should communicate about it. And though I don't always agree with the idea because uh, yeah, sometimes uh, it is really annoying and you have many people doing all kinds of selfies here, totally inappropriate on one hand. But on the other hand also, I do agree with the fact that I'd, I'd rather have them being here, even if for that moment they may misbehave or, but many actually do also understand. And um, very often it's also, uh, I've realized that many, people when you tell them something they immediately react to it and say oh yeah I actually forgot about it and it's it's this uh, leaving it open which I think is important because it can be very oppressive also yeah and if you have a place where with a fence around with a booth for ticket well not tickets but you know like a control for getting in um it might actually also destroy a little bit this uh, moment that by accident you come here. Uh, but it is controversial. The whole building of this memorial was controversial. Yeah. And uh, I will tell you a little bit about it because uh, while we are continuing now to uh, the next place that I'm going to show you. It's another of these gray blocks situated a bit further in the park. But I will continue to walk a little bit through the stelas and uh, tell you about the building of this place, the controversies that were here. And because, oh, well, why is this upside down now? Okay. As I said, it took this place 35 years to be built. Yeah, there were early ideas in the 1970s, uh, but uh, after the unification of Germany in uh, 1995, there was uh, an organization formed, the Friends of a Memorial of the Murdered European Jews, run by a very brave German journalist who stepped on many toes many times. Leah Ross is her name. She isn't Jewish despite the name, but um, she started to collect money. She started to collect ideas 
And with Berlin becoming the, so of, the so-called new old capital of Germany, it became obvious that uh, it would be necessary to have a central Holocaust memorial. Um, many people actually were very controversial or very, uh, about it for very different reasons. There was a, major, um, a minority of people that actually said, we don't want any kind of memorial. Yeah, Germany has done enough. Yeah, we do have all those camps and places. Yeah. Uh, why dedicating such an important big space in the middle of town uh, to the memorial? Oh, look, something here. Sorry, I need to switch cameras. This is unusual, not usually not here. It was an initiative of a row of candles. Yeah, put here along the memorial. Uh, this is very often done spontaneously as this, as this place here is not really a place where ceremonies are held. And this was one critique also of some people that were against the memorial. They, they called it in German eine Kranzabwurfstelle, <laughs> a place to, uh, where it has become a place, uh, they, they were afraid that it will become a place where you dump a wreath in the sense also of saying like you pay respect you do that you have a ceremony you turn around and you leave it yeah? and the idea also here was actually this is not a place really to have a big official ceremony you can do individual remembrance here yeah? but not really a place where uh yeah you have big uh, ceremonies sometimes you do uh, especially uh, where the uh, many Israeli ceremonies happen here. Uh, um, also, at the moment, we do have Mickey Levy, the uh, president of the Knesset in town. Uh, uh, but I was very happy that they did not have an official ceremony here, but did an official ceremony at the Grunewald uh, transportation uh, hub, basically, from where the deportations were organized. And so the controversy was not just in the sense of, oh, should we commemorate or shouldn't we commemorate? It was also a bit of a way of how we commemorate. And I'll have to be very honest with you. I was part of the people that said, I'm not so sure if we really need one big memorial. Yeah, because I want, we are in Germany. People can go to the places where the history actually happened. Yeah, but then... What convinced me, first of all, was when I first saw it. Yeah? I was overwhelmed by the structure. And second, it was really what I said before, the disconnection of the commemoration of the people from the commemoration of the crimes. Yeah? And I think this is the main topic here. So we are now leaving the memorial of murdered European Jews and go to the other side of the road towards the park. Over there in the back is the Brandenburg Gate. I don't know if you can see it, but we'll get closer to that memorial. Um, to that monument <laughs> in, in a while. Now, we are entering the Tiergarten, and the Tiergarten here yeah, uh, was a spot which, in this case, is kind of part of a crime scene because this part of the Tiergarten here was a cruising area for gay men. Um, a bit further down the Tiergarten, it still is, as a matter of fact. But uh, the cruising area here uh, became a place where many, mainly gay men, were arrested by snatchers from the Gestapo. And then, uh, 
very often sent to prisons, concentration camps, or being victims of really horrible medical experiments. This memorial here uh, was done, and I know there's a, ah, oh my God, I just almost fell here in the roses. Uh, uh, this memorial uh, was uh, done by a Danish uh, couple, uh, artist couple, Michael Elmgren, uh, Michael Elmgren and Inger Draxet. And they choose very similar design, which was super controversial, yeah? Because there's many people said like, what this looks like one of the blocks has escaped into the park. A friend of mine once said, it looks like one of the blocks went cruising in the park, uh, which is probably a bit what was the idea here as well, yeah, of, uh, a long forgotten victim group because the problems with the recognition of gay men and also women as victims of the Nazis had to do with the fact that many of them were prosecuted already, oh, sorry, were still prosecuted after the war. Yeah, there was a bit of a problem with recognizing them as a victim group when in Germany in the 50s and 60s, homosexuality was still illegal. The paragraph 175 was still in news, yeah, which is the paragraph that uh, criminalized gay men, only men in this case. Uh, it's actually absurd that during the Weimar Republic, the paragraph 175 was way less used and applied. And uh, in the Weimar Republic, gay men and women had way more rights than they had in Germany, especially in West Germany after the war. Only in 2002, the German government recognized gay men as a victim group uh, during the Nazi regime. That also mean, mean, meant that for many years, no reparations, no help, nothing. And, and worse for some of these people, they were criminalized still. Yeah. And I personally know a story of a man, his name is Karl B. And uh, he never actually, uh, told me his full name. I met him in Hamburg, where he was living, where, where I was born. I have a picture of him in the, I'm sorry, something's not working. Yeah. This is the only picture I have of him. Yeah, it's, uh, picture of him in, you can see it says Auschwitz at the side. Uh, most gay men were not brought to Auschwitz. They were, uh, they stayed in German concentration camps. Karl B was um, sent to Neuengamme. After a year, the SS authorities offered or like kind of asked him that he has uh, offered him a choice, you can say that, um that uh the that he can either un have the procedure of a castration and leave the concentration camp or stay in Neun Gamma. Sorry, sometimes the stories are difficult to tell. And he decided not to undergo this procedure. And then he was deported from there to Auschwitz because he helped some Polish prisoners in Neuengamme concentration camp with food. And uh, that was a reason uh, that he was sent to Auschwitz where he stayed for two years and is liberated today, 77 years ago. 
Um, Carl Bay never really talked about what happened to him until very late in his life. I met him in the 80s. He uh, died later in the 90s. And uh, sorry, I thought I switched cameras. And he um, experienced a lot of rejection, though he, uh, because he had fulfilled his sentence that he was sentenced to during the Nazi regime, he wasn't arrested. But there are stories of people that had been in concentration camps and prisons that were released when whoever, the Red Army Americans, whoever, came and released them. And some of them then, with the foundation of Germany in 1949, had, were rearrested and had to fulfill their sentences. Yeah. Uh, in 2018, the, that, that was the first time that there was an official recognition then of the President Steinmeier then, still president, who also asked for forgiveness, not only for what, have hap what, what has happened during the Nazi regime, but also for how many of these people were treated uh, later. Now, one difference is to the blocks of the memorial of the murdered European Jews is that inside here, you have a loop of videos. It's usually either two men or two women kissing with images of historic uh, gay or lesbian couples or also uh, documents uh, um, right now you can see it says something about a, the third sex, which was a book uh, written by the Jewish German researcher Magnus Hirschfeld, who was also gay and uh, who was one also of the first persons that actually gave a medical uh, scientific idea of more than two sexes of this, of the, uh, that there are obviously uh, also uh, non-binary as we call it today. Uh, we'll continue a little bit now through the park towards the Brandenburg Gate and uh, to the memorial of another victim group which we can compare more also to uh, Jews because they were the only other victim groups that were that was persecuted because of their racial or ethnical belonging. And I'm talking about the Roma and Sinti um, gypsies um, me memorial of, for about 500,000 of them that were murdered. Good. I have to walk now for a couple of minutes. So this is a good moment also for you to ask questions or remarks or share something that you want to share. I saw something, someone uh, wrote in the, in the chat, Karl Gorat was that related to something I said. Was that a name you wanted to share? Or it's the only thing I saw, so I don't know. Now, all these memorials are kind of all around the Brandenburg Gate area in the park, partly also because there is space in this park and partly also because it is very close to the governmental district and to uh, an area where many tourists are passing by. So you don't have to go on purpose to one of these memorials. You literally stumble upon them. This huge building on the side here is the US American Embassy next to the Brandenburg Gate. 
the uh, US American embassy is partly built on the remains of Goebbels bunker. Yeah, uh, so, so much for a neutral place, yes, right next to the Holocaust Memorial. Obviously, uh, we are in the former Nazi governmental district here. Questions, remarks, something that you want to share? These stories that you tell uh, really make the point and make it easier to remember. Yes. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this all, this all goes back to um, what I said at the very beginning and uh, that today also on our tour and I think also today with the liberation of, uh, of Auschwitz becoming the Holocaust Remembrance Day, not just for Auschwitz, it has exactly to do with this thing of its life yeah, that uh, is important here. It's the stories, it's seeing that these people yeah, were not only victims and were people that had hopes that lived their lives. And some like this Carl B that I mentioned, for example, yeah, he did live his life. Uh, and uh, it's, so it's also sometimes about people that, that have survived, but, uh, their experience, their memories are obviously also part of it. Now I'm standing outside the main monument of Berlin, the Brandenburg Gate that you can see here, right next to the gate in this building here, yes, uh, lived the German Jewish uh, painter, Max Liebermann. I want to share a couple of pictures. Yeah, so here, you have a historic photograph of the Pariser Platz from the other side of the gate now. Yeah, but in uh, this building here yeah, uh, that you can see uh, lived Max Liebermann with his wife, Martha. There is a picture here of Max Liebermann in, from 1932 coming out of a full station where, where he just voted not for the guy that you can see right behind him. Uh, uh, people advertising here for Hitler. 1932 was a matter of fact, the elections where Hitler got most of the votes, but he never got an absolute majority or even a majority to run the country. It's also important to remember that. And uh, it was in this house next to, uh, this is a photograph of a use of, one of the preferred use, uses of the gates. Uh, oops, oops, sorry. Sorry, I don't know why this disappeared now. Okay, one second, I'll show them again. Yeah. Uh, the Nazis love to march through the Brandenburg Gate. This is a photograph from 1940, but I'm showing this picture because uh, on the 30th of January, 1933, when Hitler uh, came to power, Max Liebermann from the rooftop of his house, this house here, saw the march of torches through the gate and he said a sentence that I want to quote here. He said, it's a pity, so I'll say it in German once, the thick Berlin German, 
Das ist ein Jammer, dass ich nicht so viel fressen kann, wie ich kotzen könnte. This is a shame, I can't eat as much as I want to puke. Sorry, those were his words about what was going on in Germany. Liebermann, though, is a perfect example of a person that eventually uh, realized what was cooking in the Weimar Republic, uh, that within this democratic system, an anti-democratic force rose to destroy this democracy. But Liebermann, I, for, I give him one credit, and this is the credit of age. Yeah, he died in 35, uh, age 87. Yeah, but Lieberman for a very long time uh, swallowed a lot of things that were going on in this democracy. And sometimes I say like, I wished many of these people of the establishment of wealthy people, Jews or non-Jews in this case, would have started doing something way earlier. Yeah, but uh, for many also the problems of the democracy uh, were then seen as the disadvantages of the democracy. And uh, I should say there were many of them were not really enthusiastic about it. Now, in this house, in 1943, uh, Martha Liebermann, his wife, and I'm going to show the photo of her, a couple of photos. Martha Lieberman, so this is a painting by her husband. Uh, she con continued to live in this house. And uh, she, after 1935, this is a photograph here of her next to the big man with the top hat on the burial of her husband. And in 1935, and this photo uh, is a picture of her, Martha Liebermann, with the director of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, uh, which was opened actually four days before Hitler came to power. And they, in 36, they did a memorial exhibition here for her husband. And here you can see them in front of a picture of her, of a painting of her. Right, for this, I don't know why the cameras. Ah. Martha Lieberman, on the evening of her deportation, because she kind of missed the moment in which she was would have been able to leave Germany. Her daughter, Käthe Ritzler, with a non Jewish husband, left Germany in 38. They tried to convince her mother to leave, but uh, she said, I'm too old to start somewhere new. I, um, she also did not want to leave this house. And then uh, on the evening of her deportation, uh, she commits suicide. She takes an overdose of Veronal, which is a very strong, strong sleeping um, powder or pill. Uh, and uh, the Gestapo found her in a coma. They first wanted to put this woman in a coma on a train of deportation. And then apparently some of these men that came to take her had mercy. They said, no, no, let, uh, let's take her to hospital first. Uh, but she could not be treated in any nearby hospital because she was Jewish. So uh, they had to walk on a stretcher with this woman uh, to the Jewish hospital, which is about like half an hour from here and five days later, Martha Lieberman died. And yeah, we could say to some, to some sense, you could say, thank God uh, that uh, she was buried then next to her husband uh, on the cemetery that we just saw. In the meantime, I continued where just next to the Bundestag that you can see here, which we'll see a bit later closer. We have a, another memorial here. And this is the memorial 
to the Sinti and Roma of Europe murdered under National Socialism. Are you able to hear the music that is playing in the background? Only very, very quietly, not really. Yeah, it's, I can try to get a bit closer to it, but uh, there, is a, there's a, there's a constant sound installation uh, uh, of a young, Roma composer uh, that is running here in the background. The composition is called uh, The Sea of Sadness. And so obviously also here you have briefs yes, from president, president of the, sorry, of the, of Germany the president of the Roma and Sinti organization. Her name is Petra Rosenberg. I'm saying her name because she's the daughter of uh, one of the survivors that I'm going to talk about in a moment. The sculpture usually is pitch black. I think in the winter they take a big less care of it. Uh, it's a bit greenish with algae now. But the idea of the artist, who is an Israeli Jewish uh, artist, Danny Caravan, he said, it's a hole. It's a hole also for people that do not have a tomb, that do not have a place that is marked with their name. And in the middle of this hole is a triangle. The triangle which reminds us here of the triangle that victims, prisoners of concentration camps had uh, to wear, and also gypsies, triangles with different colors. Around here is, I don't know if you can see, there is a writing here of a Roma poet, an Italian uh, Roma poet. I'm going to read the poem to you one second. I'm looking for it. Okay. Yeah. It's this poem around says, gaunt faces, dead eyes, cold lips quiet, a broken heart, out of breath, without words, no tears. The man, is, uh, the man who wrote this poem, his name is Santino Spinelli, and his uh, children, he's a, he, he's a child of a survivor of a different camps, you have on the ground here, scattered ground, you have names that uh, were gypsy camps. Many of them I have never heard of before. But then you also have other camps, Mittelbau Dora, for example, there was a camp in Germany um, in the former uh, how do you call this, mine, salt mine, where they were making uh, weapons and uh, rockets. Prisoners were making weapons and rockets and many prisoners never left those uh, mines.
Now, I'd like to share a little bit of a story here that I mentioned. One second, I need to take my glove off to, okay. I want to share the uh, story of Otto Rosenberg. Otto Rosenberg was born in 1927 to a woman that was called Cecilia Rosenberg. Later she changed, uh, sorry, Cecilia Herzberg. Later she changed her name to Anna Rosenberg. Um, Rosen, the family name changed because she married. Why she changed her uh, surname, I don't know. Uh, here you do see uh, Anna with four of her later to be 10 children. Uh, the person, the boy at the very left uh, is uh, Otto Rosenberg. This is a photograph which has been colored. Yeah? So it looks a bit like a painting. And uh, they uh, lived in uh, Eastern Prussia, later moved to Breslau, later moved to Berlin. By the way, this is a phenomenon that we also have from many Jews, that they left smaller places to bigger cities, partly also because uh, in the bigger cities there were communities that could help institutions of the community. Otto Rosenberg, uh, yeah, he was about um, 20, sorry, um, 26, uh, no, excuse me, 16, I miscalculated now. So this is uh, the photo here of him just before he was deported to Auschwitz. He survived and as many stories of survivors, uh, there are sometimes amazing or, or exceptions uh, that happened that made them survive. In this case, Otto Rosenberg became Mengele's shoeshine boy and uh, was paid by Mengele, which was a great gratitude, I'm quotation marks, was paid by uh, Mengele with cigarettes uh, which actually was a great gratitude because uh, he could organize uh, extra portions for food with his uh, cigarettes. And then from there, he survives. He's continued uh, when, uh, the, when they get closer to Auschwitz, they bring people back to other concentration camps. Yeah. And uh, uh, when the Red Army gets closer to Auschwitz, he's then brought to Buchenwald, uh, works in Mittelbau Dora as well, and finally survives Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen, where at the very end, many, many people, the most known one for them is Anne Frank, were simply let starve to death. He later fights, this is a picture of him in the 80s. Uh, he later fights for the recognition of Roma and Sinti and also other gypsy clans as a victim group. And uh, this is another yeah, story also where you realize maybe a bit similar to homosexuals though. I mean, they were not criminalized per se, but uh, for some gypsies, yeah, the majority had an address and were living in places. So it was really purely ethnic ideas, but it was also a bit of a rejection of their way of life, yeah? which obviously sometimes yeah, is, uh, is difficult in a, in a country in Europe yeah, where uh, there, is, there is freedom of movement, but you do have to have a passport. You do have to have an address. You do have to have some kind of established uh, connection. And I sometimes wonder actually, why not finding a solution, especially also in these times today where people are easily tracked with, uh, I don't know, uh, all kinds of uh, certificates we can get and where 
I sometimes wonder also if this not recognizing them as a victim actually is also great, has a great deal to do with the continuation also of prejudice towards their way of life. Um, there's a funny story why I know Otto Rosenberg before I prepared for, for this tour. And uh, I, and this is, also maybe part of also how much uh, of their culture sometimes was denied. There's a very famous German pop singer for people my age at least, uh, very famous. Her name is Marianne Rosenberg. Uh, you can Google her. Uh, uh, Marianne Rosenberg uh, is like, it's, it's very shallow, regular, but super popular for some time also she had, she kind of became a bit of a gay icon in Germany, but only, Three or four years ago, I came, I became aware that actually, yeah, she had this uh, a gypsy or Roma uh, origin. Uh, and uh, also for a very long time, she didn't really come out with it, though her sister, Petra Rosenberg, uh, continued the idea, uh, uh, con continued the organization that was founded by her father. Just another view here over the memorial. And one nice idea also of the artist is that this, this memorial, other than the Holocaust Memorial, does have an entry. It's always open. Yeah. And uh, here there is a lot of information visible for people uh, when they pass by different uh, to the Holocaust Memorial. Though, as I said, the Holocaust Memorial has this place of information. We're getting a little bit of a sunset, red sky here. Not that you really see the sun today. Now we are walking ahead to the Bundestag, Boma Reichstag. There is two things that I want to show there. One is a uh, memorial for the persecuted members of parliament, the members of the Reichstag that were murdered. And then we also have a look to the front of the Reichstag, as there is a quite interesting inscription, uh, which has a lot to do with the story that we were talking about of um, marginalization of victim groups during the Nazi regime, but also of the matter, of course, especially of, uh, obviously, all the people that we were talking about, basically, yeah, of their identification with Germany, with being part of Germany, until the Nazis told them that they aren't, until the Nazis came up with a very exclusive idea, uh, to say the least, of who is considered German and who is. Oops, you are upside down now, I don't know. Is it all right or is it to the uh, sidewards? Because I do see you sidewards. Okay, good. So, yeah, it's a bit of a shame that uh, right next to the Bundestag here, they, for years already, they have this temporary booths yes it's already like i don't know 15 years here yeah but uh nothing lasts as long as temporary uh, but outside the parliament with this scattered pieces of metal we have here a memorial related to 96 members 
of parliament that were murdered. Some, especially if we talk about communist members of parliament right at the beginning, yeah? uh, some later, also some people are mentioned here, such as Julius Lebel, for example, who was part of the conspiracy, so to say, of action Walkery, what was called the attempt on the 20th of July to uh, kill uh, Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944. And uh, these 96 members with these shapes are represented here in a way that uh, the idea of this scattered or metal plates is actually the shape of the district that uh, they used to represent in the Reichstag, when it was still a Reichstag, uh, uh, until, well, 1933 for most of them. And there's one story I want to tell here about Johanna Tesch, who was from Frankfurt. She was born in 1875, and she died uh, end of March in 1945 in the concentration camp of Ravensbrück of starvation. Literally a couple of weeks only before yeah, the concentration camp of Ravensbrück was liberated by the Red Army. Johanna Tesch, uh, I'm showing you some pictures, one second. Sorry, I'm on, I'm off, okay. So this is a picture of her uh, just before she uh, was elected in 1919 um, in the Weimar Republic to the parliament. She was a member of the SPD, the Social Democrat Party. And uh, she was an activist for women's rights. Uh, she was uh, also, uh, encouraging and trying to um, to open the society towards mentally ill people and also handicapped children. Uh, something we should not forget. I mean, the Nazis, yes, came up with programs of euthanasia and all this, but also yeah, before the Nazis, uh, many, many, many families kind of were ashamed of their handicapped children, tried to get them into institutions, and uh, she was trying to offer help yeah, through institutions for families uh, that had those handicapped children. In 1924, she publishes her letters uh, to her husband, which uh, because she lived in Berlin, her husband lived in Frankfurt and uh, Johanna Tesch uh, wrote in these letters about her frustration of politics, of being a woman in this parliament and of not being able to do as much as she wants to do. Uh, she wrote in one letter, she wrote in that, which became the title of her book. She wrote, their diver, their divers are the political, their, their politics should go to hell. Uh, <coughs> she uh, then uh, resigned in 1925, now uh, became active in many social works and uh, during, uh, ah, this is also interesting. This is from the website of the Bundestag where you can have all the information of all the members of all the members of parliament. And what I find interesting that with all this list that you have, the auto ascendancy, the, the men are just named with their family name, but for a woman, they had to point out that it is a woman and they wrote Frau Tesch and not just uh, Tesch or her name. Um, Johanna Tesch then fell victim in 1944 when after Operation Valkyrie, many, many opponents that were still there were arrested. Yeah? Uh, she, the Nazis started with an action which was called Aktion Gewitter, Aktion Thunderstorm. They randomly arrested uh, Upon and some weren't even active anymore. Yeah, she had long retired and also kind of probably went into an, an inner exile. 
yeah, because you definitely disagreed with the Nazis. Uh, but uh, yeah, also at the age of she was in her seventies already. Uh, they bring her. Uh, they suddenly arrest her, uh, bring her to Ravensbrück, and yeah, as I said before, uh, due to the conditions in Ravensbrück, she dies a couple of weeks before the end of the war. Now we have a view here in the government district. That's because I want to I want to take you to the entrance of the Bundestag. Over there, you can see Merkel's <laughs> Merkel's office. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> Scholz office. Sorry, it has been too long <laughs> that I call this Merkel's office. Uh, the chancellor. What is interesting is that the uh, decision of building the new government quarter next to the Bundestag, former Reichstag, and as you can see here now, there is an a light installation, we remember. And then uh, on the wall, I don't know if you can see it, but there is a projection in memory to the victims of national socialism. And this is also a beautiful site here because, uh, well, there's the Israeli flag because I told you that the president of the Knesset, you know, the speaker of the Knesset is, uh, in uh, Berlin at the moment. And you see here the European, the Israeli, the German flag in Hasmast. Now, one last story is the inscription on the top of the entrance to the parliament, dem deutschen Volke, to the German people. This inscription was planned there already when uh, Paul Vallaud, who built the parliament yeah, in the, it was opened in, 19, in, sorry, in 1894, uh, but uh, Paul Vallaud planned this inscription dedicated to the German people here, but the emperor refused. Yeah? The emperor didn't, William II didn't like the whole idea of this parliament in the first place, uh, so this, in, this inscription was never uh, put up there until uh, during the First World War, uh, a, uh, an initiative also that, was, that wanted to strengthen the idea of the parliament. And, uh, and during the Second World War, the Reichstag got stronger, which is then also why from here, from this balcony over there, Philip Scheidemann declared on the 9th of November, the first Republic of Germany, yeah, later be called Weimar Republic, just because the constitution was signed in Weimar. But this inscription up here, yeah, was put up in 1916 by a Jewish foundry home house. Uh, the company was called S.A. Levy, uh, which was a Germanization basically of Levy. Uh, S.A. Levy. Uh, they donated as a patriotic act during the First World War. They donated this inscription to the parliament and the letters are made from French cannons that were captured during the First World War. Uh, yes, it's a, a lot of patriotism here, a lot of Jewish German patriotism here. Levy and his family, they converted to Christianity later. Um, they had no. They did not feel at least not much of a connection of a co of a connection uh, to their Jewish past or ancestry. But all of a sudden, during the racial laws in 1935, they became Jews. And except for uh, one daughter of the Asai Lubi uh, family, 
that escaped uh, to the US. Our family remained in Germany, basically saying like, they won't do this to us. Very similar to Martha Lieberman, also said like, I am the wife of one of the most famous German painters. Probably they felt like, hey, we put this inscription on the Reichstag, but the Nazis didn't care much about the parliament, of course. And also they did not care about much about patriotism of this family. And also the Levy family yeah, uh, was uh, deported and most of them uh, murdered in different camps. Great. Thank you uh, for being with me on this tour. Um, yes, I will go. It's super windy. I will. There, there is a small booth. I walk there, and are because I'll be happy to hear from you. And I know we also had some distressing stories. So please feel free to contact the embassy or um, Micah, if you also feel you can share, if you feel like that it is all right, share my address, my email address on in the chat. And uh, because sometimes questions might come up later and I, I'd be happy to, to answer and be there. Well, well, do. I just have one comment. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. Yes, um, I can hear you. So following, I think it's very remarkable that the Germans have so many monuments and recognizing the mistakes and the wrongdoings of the past. Yes. Um, and to learn out of it and to do everything that something like this doesn't happen in future. I would wish that a similar attitude would exist here in North America. Their wrongdoings are very much ignored or, uh, yeah, yeah, not, yeah. But it, it's uncomfortable for the people here, <clears throat> not as much for the Germans. I mean, I was once asked when I, when I came here to Canada, I said, how is it to be a German and to live with all these wrongdoings in the past? And I said, yeah, okay, it was the generation before me, but I acknowledge it. And I will do everything that it's not being forgotten and that it doesn't happen again. So and yes. I would wish that it's similar in North America, but it isn't. Yeah, I mean, one thing I can add to this, yes, Germany has done a lot. Obviously, you know, as you're critical about North America because you live there, yeah, it's, I'm also super critical about many things and one major critique, and maybe I did not point this out so much, though it became probably clear due to the, uh, sorry, I'm sitting in the bus stop and there is a light changing, so it's not, and I didn't go to a disco or something, it's just a bit weird. Um, but is here that uh, many of these memorials are the commemoration, or sometimes not so much for Jews, but also for other victim groups, the recognition was done very, very late, as I pointed out. Uh, and uh, obviously it also had a lot to do that many of these memorials were put up and built up after the separation of Germany was over, uh, after Berlin also became the capital. Uh, and uh, there are memorials for deportations and also there was a memorials for prosecuted homosexuals in Hamburg and in Frankfurt and in other places. So some of it has ha happened in Berlin later because it became the capital of the United Germany and also an international expectation, I would say probably uh, related to that. But I have to say one thing and um, that especially when it came to help, to reparations, to recognize victim groups and compensate victim groups. Yeah. Um, for example, this Carl B that I mentioned, yes, he never got a penny from the German state for six years he spent in a concentration camp. He had many problems because he, had, uh, he was a criminal yeah, by German law. In the 50s and 60s, he was a criminal. Um, 
the criminal records were only erased in 2002 when uh, the state recognized them as victims. Uh, for most of them, this was completely irrelevant because they were long dead. So yeah, there, there is a lot that is done, is done, and there's a lot of awareness. And I was very happy that also just yesterday they published, uh, it was in, uh, also in the news in Germany, that apparently the awareness of 20 to 40, the, the interest and awareness of 20 to 40 year olds in this past is way higher than uh, the interest of 40 to 60 years old. I found that very, very comforting. I agree. Yeah. Good. Are there perfect. any other questions? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for your words. It's not perfect, but I really liked you too. Uh, also in November, December. So. Uh, it, ah, you were there. It, Thank you. <laughs> it's very nice. nice to walk with you through Berlin <laughs> and to sit in a warm room. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I will get warm in a, in a, in a while. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Hi. Hi, it's Abe in Ottawa. I want, Hi, to, Abe. Agree. Hi, I want to agree with what the other, other, <coughs> other men said, especially about uh, Aboriginal children here and so on. Uh, but I also want to mention that uh, because you're only walking around there, <coughs> two other uh, important monuments that I've seen, one is Gleis 17, which is far away, of course, and the yeah. other one is a collection point by, by what used to be an old folks home, Jewish old folks home or hospital, which is a little bit uh, on the other side. I forgot what area it is. Ah, are you talking about Levetzostrasse? This... Uh... <laughs> It was a community center and a synagogue, but I'm, or I mean, there, there are a couple of places, yes. Yeah, 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 okay. And the important one was the Gleis 17, which is in Grunewald. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mentioned it when I mentioned that the yeah. ceremony, the official yeah. ceremony of the government uh, yeah. with the Israeli um, head of the Knesset, yeah, that yeah. ceremony was happening on uh, track 17. Correct, correct. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you very much, it was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Cheers. 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 Great. Any other questions, remarks? Then this is the moment. Yeah. Hello? I can hear you. I can see you, but oh. I can hear you. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Chantal, and I work for Parks Canada. Um, and. I, I see a couple of my colleagues have also joined in this morning. It's I, I, I've been to Berlin a few times, once in 1992 and then again in 2007. And it's such a remarkable city. So thank you for, for giving us the tour. Um, my colleagues and I work in the National Program of Historical Commemoration um, that Parks Canada leads on behalf of the Government of Canada. So I think... Uh, I've I've found this present. Sorry, that was a bus because yeah, oh, it's okay. raining and windy. But <laughs> no, no, oh, sorry, yeah. I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear the last sentence because of the bus. Oh, yeah, my colleagues and I work in the national program of historical commemoration um, ah. that Parks Canada yes. administers on behalf of the government of Canada. And I guess one of the words that we, we, we've been hearing lately that uh, because we work on the commemoration of residential schools, um, and I'm a descendant of residential school, grandparents who attended residential schools, one of the yeah. words that people really struggle with is the word commemoration, um, because they equate that with a celebration and that only positive things, they don't, they don't think dark things oh, should okay. be commemorated. So is it just the word itself or is there a better way to describe the concept, do you think? It's, it, it, it's uh, we're, we're really struggling to communicate to some of our, our partners that we're not celebrating, we're recognizing the, the history of the past. I have to say that I am as a non-native English speaker, I'm probably not aware that the word commemoration is more positive than negative because for me, the word commemoration 
mainly related to what I do, also what I then do in English very often. There are tours, groups in, at the museums are also in town is then very often simply related to yeah, the commemoration of Nazi crimes uh, in Berlin are also crimes of, uh, that happened during the East German period. Um, so in, in German, yeah, the word is actually, yeah, it is Erinnerung, yes, basically, or which is more memory. Yeah, but this, which can be both, which can be the memory of something, but it can also be yeah, a, an event. Yeah, um, or, a, or you say a Gedenkveranstaltung, which is probably, yeah, which I would translate to commemorate, commemoral service, or no, that's so religious. I'm, I'm trying to find, uh, I'm, I'm may, maybe I'm not a hundred percent sensitive enough now to the words of to the what what commemoration can mean in 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 english because as i understand you kind of like ask if there is if i could use or if i could find another word or no no that, that's good and i see someone put in the chat here that uh she identified the word reflection and i think that's actually a really good word i'm gonna yeah. bring that back yeah. to our teams <laughs> which is actually also a bit closer to the word gedenken because gedenken in german also comes from from thinking from reflecting on something yeah mm -hmm. and uh yes well thank you I, if I, I yeah thank you thank you um, I can, uh, now you get me thinking and I like looking for words and also reference with other languages. Yeah, um, you have my email. If you drop me an email and I come up with something, I can let you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great, thank you. I, I'd like to thank you and I'd like to thank everyone for uh, making time for prioritizing uh, this important day and the his, this history and keeping remembering and keeping uh, the memory alive and let's all do our part to make sure this does not happen again. Yes, thank you, Micah. I uh, thank you for being there and uh, it's We've done a couple of tours, but I have to say this is this was for me one of the the hardest also because uh, it's yes, we talk about things that continue, we talk about life, but we also talk about the the other side of it the the reflection uh, that this history had here in this town.